It is a great joy to be with you here at the at the seminary. It's been a joy since uh, the first time I came here uh, to see the growth in the student body and uh, and the spirit in the student body. The truth of the matter is that uh, when you are invited, as you will eventually discover, when you're invited to speak at a seminary chapel service and then you, you preach, then students come to you at the end and um, patronizingly tell you that you did rather well um, since they've been sitting there in a spirit of judgment uh, <laughs> in the seat of Moses and uh, making the erroneous assumption uh, that they can compare this preacher with another preacher and make a divine judgment. But uh, sometimes a student will come up and say, that was very fine. But of course, you wouldn't have preached at that level in your own congregation. And one of the things you get away with in the United States, if you're an alien resident, as I obviously am, is you can just make noises in response to comments uh, that you feel it would be cruel to respond to. But actually, your mind is often thinking, uh, Sonny boy, that was a dumbed-down version of what I usually preach to my own congregation. <laughs> um, you don't think that I would preach in the same way to theological students I don't know uh, as I preach to the congregation I do know and seek to feed week after week after week. Now, having said that, which to some of you, you may already be thinking, who is this Scotsman who has come to insult us, seminary students? Uh, this, is, this is one place where I have visited where I know that one doesn't need to dumb down the message. Uh, but uh, in a very remarkable way, the message dovetails with these two hymns that we've been singing, um, and there is actually nothing at all uh, complicated about this message, uh, except it is about a subject that in some ways is the most complex subject in the universe, the providence of God. And I want to encourage you to turn in your Bibles to a most familiar passage in this connection. You've preached six better sermons than this one on this passage. I understand that, and I humble myself before you in seeking to expound it. Uh, but it is the, the closing section of the great Joseph narrative in the book of Genesis, and we're going to read Genesis chapter 50 and verses 15 through 21. 15 through 21. This closing section, of course, uh, ends with uh, the death of the father in the family. And when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. You always hope, knowing these brothers, that this at last was the truth. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin, because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. It's the ultimate resolution, isn't it, of Joseph's dream in chapter 37. But Joseph said to them, and this is the ultimate resolution of Joseph's life, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. 
Imagine, like many of you, I was not brought up in a Christian home, and my parents didn't attend uh, worship until after I was converted as a, as a 14, coming on 15-year-old teenager. And we didn't have many books in our house. I, I'm a post-war baby, and I can still remember food rationing as a little boy in Scotland. And uh, we were not a family of any great material prosperity. And so there was very little literature in the house, although all of my family members were avid readers and library users. But there was one book in our home that fascinated me. Although my parents were not churchgoers, they, for some reason or another, my mother had kept my grandmother's Bible, a grandmother I never knew and in those cold Scottish mornings when I was a, a little boy, having learned to read before I went to elementary school at the encouragement of my parents, I used to get into my parents' bed in the early morning after they'd got up. Uh, these are days before central heating and, for that matter, central air conditioning, and uh, the bed would still be warm. It was as good as an electric blanket. And there were two stories in the Old Testament scriptures that I always loved to read. Uh, the first of them was the story of Daniel. And I found that difficult to find. I knew there was a book called Daniel, but uh, I could never remember exactly where I had lost it towards the end of the Old Testament. And the other story was the story of Joseph. Sometimes I had the same problem there because I had learned there was no book called Joseph, and so I had to find my way to where Joseph had lost himself in the opening book of the Scriptures. And uh, actually, it was only when I was thinking about the message for this morning chapel service, it dawned on me what an amazing divine providence that was in my life, that I so loved the story of Joseph. Because uh, without me being conscious of it, I think God was investing into my life even before I came to saving faith in him. I think God was investing in my life a gift for pastoral ministry. I mean this particular gift, that in the story of Joseph, from earliest years, I was learning how to answer people's Joseph's question. And in different ways it emerges, of course, in this magnificent narrative. Uh, it comes to a resolution in this closing section. But the Joseph question is a question that will be on the lips of our uh, congregation every single day. Somebody among our people is asking this question, what on earth is God doing in my life and for my life? And among other things, in the midst of this narrative, as it finds its place in the story of God's redemption, at the, at the micro level, the story of Joseph enables us to have a sense of the divine in this story, written, as it were, in such large letters that he who runs can still read that we're able to take from God's Word according to the principles of the New Testament Scriptures, that these things, yes, the Joseph narrative also is written for our exemplification and our instruction as well as its place in the flow of redemptive history, that as we take these large capital letters in which God writes His providence into the life of Joseph, we're able to bring that down to bear upon our own lives, because we are the ones who may be asking the question, and to bear on the lives of others, because every single day among our people the Joseph question is going to arise, what on earth is the Lord doing in my life? And how do I sustain faith in the midst of a situation where everything seems to be falling to pieces round about me? And if you're a minister of a congregation of any size, that means every day and every single week.
So this is a, this is a passage for personal investment. And this is a passage for pastoral investment in these great words that Joseph speaks to his brothers in the resolution of the narrative. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. And he almost tells us this fits under the locus, the providence of God. Do not fear, he says, I will provide for you and for your little ones. Now, you are very familiar with the story. It's a drama, uh, perhaps in five acts, beginning in the family home where Joseph is made the father's favorite and is given the coat and has the dreams and boasts to his brothers so naively and I think foolishly finds that he has aroused their jealousy, and then he is sold as a slave, eventually going to Egypt. Act two, he is in the house of Potiphar and experiences this great drama of the solicitations of Potiphar's wife. He stands true in the testing, but as a result, he experiences humiliation. And that in itself is a great lesson for the children of God to learn, and many are slow to learn it, that obedience to God's Word does not necessarily lead to delights in this world, may even lead to humiliation and distress, and what others may regard as disaster. And then at the center turning point, when he is there in the prison, And again, dreams enter into the story, and there is the hope of recovery only to be dashed by human forgetfulness and sinfulness until eventually Pharaoh himself dreams, and uh, Joseph is raised up to be the wonderful man of wisdom he proves to be. And then the days of his exaltation and the providence of God in times of famine, uh, bringing his family again to an interconnection with him. And at last, the days of extraordinary dominion. Uh, Perhaps second most powerful man, certainly in the nation, perhaps in a sense in the whole world. And out of all this, God has been preparing him to be both the means of a salvation for the people, and also especially the central means, the divinely raised up means to bring about a a resolution of a narrative that has gone on way beyond the Joseph story in the past, and a reconciliation between father and uh, sons, and brother and brother. And twice Joseph gives the clue to what God has been doing back in chapter 45, when uh, at last he had shown himself to his brothers. And he is to tell them three times that God's sovereign hand has been on the situation. Chapter 45 and verse 5, God sent me before you to preserve life. Verse 7, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth. So, verse 8, it was not you who sent me here, but God who sent me here. And then, of course, the quintessential uh, exposition of this in uh, Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. It's the Old Testament statement and biographical exposition of the New Testament's principle that God works everything together for the good of his children who are called according to his purpose. And ultimately that purpose, as Paul says, is to conform us to the likeness of the Lord Jesus as our elder brother. Uh, God has made Christ head over all things for the church. God in his sovereignty 
massed on minds every moment of human history to bring about the ultimate destiny that he has in view for his beloved people at the center of his purposes for the universe that he created. But life, life looked at from the horizontal point of view is a veritable jigsaw puzzle. Uh, We are not, I am sure here, we are not that kind of arrogant believer that knows exactly moment by moment what it is that God is doing in the circumstances of our lives. And since life is a jigsaw puzzle, uh, one of the first things that uh, Christian believers need is for the corner pieces of the puzzle to be put in place in order that on the the basis of these cornerstones, as it were, we may be able to frame the picture that God is creating in our individual life and our personal experience and help others at least to begin to have the corner pieces in place that uh, God's story, God's portrait of their lives may begin to fit into the teaching of Scripture. And there are, I think, four corner pieces that we can find here in the Joseph narrative and, and particularly in this text. And I want simply to, to present them to you as a series of four theses that are of immense importance to us personally and of great usefulness to us pastorally. The first is this, that God is constantly working together a variety of circumstances. God is constantly working. He is perpetually working in a variety of circumstances. You take Joseph's life, and it's punctuated by a series of discrete events and experiences that in and of themselves seem to make no sense whatsoever. But because God is constantly working, even where his working is not visible to us, the conviction that God is constantly working together a variety of circumstances is of the very essence of being stayed upon Jehovah and having a heart that is truly at rest. Uh, your children, if you have children, uh, you probably have bought those, uh, those cheap little books where they can scribble all over it and it doesn't matter and, and uh, there may be uh, a page where they join up the dots. And these dots seem to them Not to you, because you are wise and mature. You see the picture just because you see the dots. But the children, they have ever so patiently, and sometimes to their frustration, they have got to join up the dots together before they're able to stand back and say, Ah, it was a boat all the time. But you, who have, as it were, been in the place of God by comparison with their childish approach to these dots, you have known from the beginning it is a sailing boat. It couldn't be anything else. And so it is, however frail the illustration, in the economy of our Heavenly Father, in all of these apparently discreet and sometimes to us meaningless dots, God is working together constantly, a variety of circumstances. As uh, John Flavel so famously says, the providences of God are so often like Hebrew words. They can only be well read when you read them backwards. (laughs) Or if you're a Hebrew, forwards. But you see the point. There are times when Joseph seems lost in the darkness, and God seems intolerably slow in his purposes. 
but God sees in the darkness. The darkness and the light are both alike to him, and God is never out of step with himself. And it's only when you, when you come to the end, when Joseph comes to the end, although I think there are all kinds of hints in the whole narrative that the man's soul is stayed upon Jehovah. It's only now as he, as he looks back and the dots have been joined up that he sees the glorious purposes of God. And there are all kinds of illustrations of this. I think one of the most striking illustrations of this is the frustrations that the little apostolic band had in uh, Acts chapter 16 before they eventually come, as you remember, to preach the gospel in Philippi. And what seems to me to be so striking about this is that this is, this is Timothy's first experience of apostolic ministry. And what does he discover? He discovers that the, that the apostle Paul is faced with all kinds of perplexities that he's not able to explain. And uh, you remember uh, how it goes. Uh, Paul gets Timothy to accompany him, I believe, as a substitute for John Mark, as Silas. The older man is a substitute for Barnabas. Immense wisdom in this. But what they discover, they they, they go through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, 16 verse 6. They're forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Well, that's all very well for the Holy Spirit to forbid you. But that doesn't tell you anything except what you're not supposed to do. Then they come up to Mycenae. They attempt to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus didn't allow them. They end up in Troas. And it's like a series of confused dots. What's the meaning of this? Now, well, we know we are, uh, we've, we've got to the end of the book of Acts. We understand what all this is about. But Paul doesn't. All Paul knows is God seems to be putting roadblocks in the way of his deepest aspiration to preach the gospel. What on earth is God doing? Well, what God is doing is this, and uh, it is uh, at least statistically inevitable that this will be true for numbers of us in the ministry. God is putting the apostolic band down a cul-de-sac, a dead-end road, because God wants his purposes and his timing to coincide And then he will bring them into the traffic of his purposes, where they will be most gloriously used. Indeed, out of all of this will emerge what seems to me, if I can put it this way, if Paul had a favorite church, then it was probably the church in Philippi. Uh, The only church he refers to as having elders and deacons. So that should tell you something, especially if you're a Presbyterian, that tells you something. (laughs) It's, his, it's the first crown and joy Presbyterian Church of Philippi, isn't it? <laughs> uh, but you experience this if you're an apostle, don't you? What a lesson, incidentally, for Timothy. What a great lesson to be a younger servant of Christ with an older servant of Christ when things don't seem to work out. And to know that God is constantly working together a variety of circumstances. And what we need to do, it's, uh, you know well, it's this. We need to learn what our culture so abominates. We need to learn to wait upon the Lord. And to wait on His timing in the traffic, His ways are perfect. And uh, um, now that I am actually one of these older men, uh, I've seen this again and again in ministers, younger ministers of great giftedness, finding themselves in positions of extraordinary frustration and having to sit down with them and say, God uses the cul-de-sac principle. It's the Joseph principle. Wait on the Lord. The time will come 
and rejoicing to see the burst of fruitfulness that God has purposed for his children who wait upon him. So God is constantly working together a variety of circumstances. Secondly, God is simultaneously working in a variety of people. Now this is a singularly important lesson for us to learn because, and I don't think this is simply a post-enlightenment phenomenon, I think this is, a, this is a human phenomenon. When things go a little dodgy, we almost always frame the question in terms of me, don't we? What is God doing in my life? Why are these things happening to me? And of course, uh, so long as we ask that question, we are going to be destabilized. Because particularly in ministry, what God is doing in our lives may be minimally related to our lives, but it's intended to be maximally related to others' lives. So that the ultimate answer to my question, Lord, what are you doing in my life? It's surely going to be for us. Actually, what I'm doing in your life, my dear child, is far more significant for the lives of others. That's why you can't see exactly what it is that I'm doing, because I am never working just in one person's life. Actually, it betrays our arrogance a little, doesn't it? What are you doing in my life? You know, if I were God, I'd be saying, have you any idea how many misformed Christians I'm having to deal with here? And you're asking, what about me? What about my life? Have you no sense of the vastness of my plans? And it's very evidently spelt out, isn't it? In, in the Joseph narrative, one of my dear colleagues uh, from Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia, uh, Dr. Gaffin, uh, his, his dear daughter, uh, at a young age had cancer and uh, eventually went to be with the Lord and uh, she would be in the services huddled up with a blanket to try and keep warm. She had, she had lost so much uh, weight and had so little energy and uh, her minister said to me, you know, she said to me one day as I shook her hand, she said, I think I'm beginning to get it. It's not really about me, is it? It's not really about me. Because the answer to the question, Lord, what are you doing in my life? As I say, may have much more to do with the lives of others than it seems to have with us. And the scriptures are full of this, aren't they? Um, I sometimes think that the story of Naomi and Ruth is, is such a superb narrative illustration of this. Here is Naomi... And uh, whatever one thinks about the failure of her husband's leadership of the family, she is there in Moab, the husband dies, the two boys uh, marry into the Moabite clan and, and thereby, as it were, bar the door of fellowship to their children and their children's children into the future. And everything goes pear-shaped. And... Uh, she went away full, and the Lord brought her back empty. She experienced much bitterness. She couldn't have seen that the purposes of God in her life were actually the conversion of her daughter-in-law, Ruth. She certainly couldn't have seen, as the author of the book of Ruth wants us clearly to see, that God's purpose in her life was that she and her Moabite daughter-in-law would be brought into the immediate family tree whose genetic structure would appear in King David? And how could she possibly have seen that this family tree into which Ruth had been brought, of which she was a mother in Israel, would actually be the family tree of the Savior? Um, if she had said to God, what are you doing in my life? Uh, she would never have been able to understand. But she early apparently was able to understand 
what God has been doing in my life has actually been for the sake of the lives of others. And you find this, don't you, in uh, the Joseph narrative, that through all of this, God is dealing at a very profound level with Jacob. Uh, he, was, he, was, he was untwisted, but he wasn't fully and finally untwisted by any stretch of the imagination. He repeated the foolish error of his father in making Joseph his favorite. Isaac loved Esau because he ate his game. Hey, there's the story. And what do we read about the son? We read the son loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was the son of his old age. You know, you get to a stage in life where you may respond to a situation and think, where on earth did that come from? I don't usually respond to situations like that. And then you have a flashback to your father in a similar situation. And you had thought for decades you were nothing like your father. And then you realized you're still your father's son. And if there's something twisted about your response, you who thought yourself to be fully and finally untwisted are still in the process of the, of the not being loosened. And it was a deep and painful experience for Jacob, who needed to lose the favorite son in order to gain all of his sons as their father. And then there are the brothers who are inflamed with hatred and jealousy. It's spelt out for us in the opening chapter. They hated him. They hated him. They hated him because they were jealous of him. And... and uh, God is working in their lives to bring them to a confession of their sin and their guilt. And it's very remarkable to see the way this happens in, in chapter 42, chapter 44. You can read it for yourself. The way in which they are brought at last to a guilt consciousness and to an understanding that God has been pursuing them. The language they use of Joseph is actually the language that they were thinking of God. It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. And yet, there is something happening also in the people, that all that Joseph has gone through has become the means of providing for the material needs of the people and the spiritual needs of his family. And uh, what God has been doing is this. He has been breaking, even destroying, that immature teenage pride that he was something special. And the utter lack of wisdom. Even supposing those dreams were divinely given, as of course, in some providential sense, they must have been divinely given. He utterly lacked wisdom. If you have a dream like that tonight and you have a bunch of brothers and sisters at home, I hope by this stage in life you're not going to open your stupid mouth at breakfast time the next day. You remember how in uh, that larger section that we read today, um, Jesus has the wisdom to say to Peter, I know you don't understand what I'm doing now. So I'm going to jump in and explain it all to you, Peter. Afterwards you will understand. I have many things to say to you, but you're not able to bear them. My, what a lesson that is for us as pastors of congregations. Eh, to guard us from dumping everything we've learned in seminary onto our new congregation in the first four sermons. But to understand that wisdom is required. And at the end of the day, it's so beautiful really, at the end of the day, as the brothers come and actually do what he dreamt they would do. Something of this happened in your life. The very thing of which you dreamt, you dreamt, 
And then when it actually happens, he says to these brothers, do not fear. Am I in the place of God? So God is wonderfully working, constantly working together a variety of circumstances, simultaneously working in a variety of lives. And of course, he is persistently working towards a variety of goals. In Jacob, this beautiful joy in restoration. And it's marvelous, isn't it, the way God deals with him? Uh, how, and it's so, so like the Lord, isn't it, to deal with us in terms of the, of the special avenues in which we have thrust him out of our lives. And the Lord comes and, and deals with this hyper love, carnal love really for his son Joseph by the loss of the Joseph substitute whom now he had replaced in his affections. He learns, doesn't he, that uh, the only way the Lord fills our hands is if they are emptied in order that he may fill them. And it's excruciatingly painful but it's the work of the surgeon's knife, and he knows perfectly what he is doing. And the same would be true of the brothers. Uh, in, in that connection, isn't, isn't one of those, those great moments in Bible narrative when uh, they're hosted at the meal by Joseph, and they come to the table, and there are the little place cards on the table, as it were, and they discover... I asked a mathematician once, what are the chances of this happening simply by chance? And he gave me this enormous number with zeros. And they must have, they must have thought, what on, what on earth is God doing here? This is uncanny. But you see, it was a little reminder, wasn't it? It was a divine ministry to them that God was, God was undoing the hatred and the jealousy that was in their hearts because their father had a mistaken priority and what God was bringing them to. What a wonderful thing this is in the family of grace that the, that the errors and the dysfunctions and the distortions that are created by man are undone in the providence of God as he works towards a variety of goals where these brothers at the last are willing to come and do what their brother had said at breakfast time they, they would do and they do it with earnest hearts and spirits with a deep-seated confession of their sin and then in Joseph to bring this man to be God's man in God's place and at God's time. The patience he lacked. 17, and he's so impatient for everyone to know. Later on in life, he's able to wait for seven years in order to deal with the seven years that are still to come. That's an interesting, that would be an interesting thing to apply to gospel ministry, wouldn't it? That you need to see the end from the beginning and wait patiently on the Lord as he fulfills his own gracious purposes in the lives of his people and the marvelous grace that he displayed as God in his providence shapes his life. There's one final thing I want us to notice. It's this. It's not specifically stated in the passage, but it's surely abundantly clear from the framework of the whole of Scripture that as well as constantly working together a variety of circumstances and working simultaneously in a variety of people and working persistently towards a variety of goals, 
God is working unfailingly to bring glory to his Son. I mean that in the broad, redemptive, historical sense. I don't use that expression to my own congregation. Or usually in seminaries, because students throw it around, but you're never sure they know what it means. But you know what it means. In the broad, redemptive, historical sense, here is one of God's great markers in the outworking of his covenant with Abraham the promise of what would happen to the people, and then they would be brought up out of the land of bondage and all in fulfillment of the essential promise that in Abraham's seed one day the nations of the earth, you and I, would find saving blessing. So it's all pointing towards the Lord Jesus. But in a very special way it's pointing towards not just the Joseph principle, but the the Jesus principle. That exaltation follows humiliation. That the abundance of grace to provide for the people of God comes out of the depths of the testing and the sorrow and the agony of the cross. That God highly exalts him because he had been so deeply humiliated that he provides salvation out of the riches of his humiliation. And although Joseph is not sinless, and in that sense very unlike our Savior, there is something ultimately quite Jesus-like about Joseph, wouldn't you think? That the pattern of death and resurrection, humiliation and exaltation produces in him the fruit of the Holy Spirit, makes him a man about whom Pharaoh can singularly say, I don't understand this man and I don't know where he gets it from, but this man is marked by the Spirit of God. And yes, in the Old Testament Scriptures as well as the New, the great purpose of the Spirit of God is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the ways in which he does that is by reproducing in the lives of his children Christ-likeness. And at the end of the day, that's what the providence of God is for in our lives. So that we are able to say, whatever your purposes are for others, through this Heavenly Father, make me more like him. He works everything together according to the counsel of his will. He works all things for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. For, it is a pity, isn't it, that we isolate texts. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So wherever we may be in the Joseph cycle, may the Lord use his providences in our lives and his wisdom from his word in the lives of others, that we may grow in likeness to our Savior. And in growing in likeness to him, it may also be said of us that all of these things that God has brought into the symphony of our lives have taken place for the salvation of many people, that Jesus will see of the fruit of the travail of his soul and be satisfied with his providential purposes, the lives of his children. Let's pray together. Our gracious Father, we thank you for your word and today for the rich diversity of the modes and genre in which you communicate your purposes and your principles and uh, your ultimate desires to us. We, we are a group of those, some of us love the, the tight argumentation of the Apostle Paul, and others are drawn to the, 
the proddings and probings of the parables of our Lord Jesus. And others of us find the poetry of the Psalter uh, not only speaking to us, but richly speaking for us, helping us to frame our lives in the light of your word. And we thank you also for these narratives and for this story of your child so long ago in whose life you wrote in capital letters the principles of your gracious providence. And we pray as we ourselves live within the handiwork of your providence that you would make us Joseph-like and growing in wisdom and Jesus-like in growing in grace. So, Lord, pronounce your benediction upon us and work your sovereign will through us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.